Hey guys, so um, I thought I'd do a quick video today um, just about history. And the reason I, I'm sort of inspired to do this is because I just saw a lot of uh, YouTube videos um, about traveling that were not very good. And a lot of them involved, you know, traveling without money. Um, one of them was about a stockbroker who lost his money in the uh, 2008 financial crash um, and then decided to travel the world. Um, but if you really sort of, you know, look at what these videos are saying is that they're basically saying that we're going to exchange our time for experiences. And that's, that's fantastic. That's what more of us should do. The problem is that, you know, if you look at the way these people are doing it, um, a lot of their sort of strategy, uh, revolves around hitchhiking, which not everyone can do. Um, it revolves around going to very low-cost countries uh, where the U.S. dollar or the Japanese yen or the euro uh, it, you know, goes a long way. And it also typically involves going to uh, villages, uh, in other words, not cities. And so a lot of the people, if you notice, will go to India, um, will go to... Um, which has a lot of, you know, um, villages, a lot of places in addition to a lot of major um, cities. Um, you know, you, you'll never see somebody sort of pursuing the strategy by going through Europe. Um, uh, even if they are doing something like uh, couch surfing, uh, you know, whether just informally or whether it's on, on the actual application. And so what, I, what, what was sort of depressing to me um, as I'm sort of scrolling through the first five minutes and, you know, of, of all these different videos about people who travel the world is that it's, it's actually never been cheaper to travel the world. Obviously, right now, we're in the middle of this coronavirus epidemic. And so travel has been shut down for at least two weeks, um, uh, up to about a month. And the U.S. government is actually recommending that, that U.S. citizens return uh, to uh, the United States to the extent that they're still uh, traveling abroad. I happen to be in Singapore. Singapore is has a more developed infrastructure um, than most countries, primarily because it's small. Um, and of course, historically, it had a niche um, in terms of having a, a port. And once you become a transit center for you know economic goods, you have to have a financial center. Um, that means you have to invest in technology and so on. So the government in Singapore has a lot of credibility because it's managed to keep up um, almost continuously with the changing times. Even now, you'll hear about you'll hear stories about uh, hand sanitizer, um, you know, becoming scarce. Well, in response, the government of Singapore is actually giving um, hand sanitizers to all of its uh, citizens. Um, I don't know exactly how it's it's going to be delivered, um, but I just saw a notice in the mail, um, and basically, it's it's going to be delivered. Um, or available for pickup uh, to any citizen who wants it. So the reason that I'm doing this video is just to sort of remind people that, you know, you don't have to hitchhike um, or travel without money. Um, you, you can just sort of, you know, figure out um, a couple of ways of doing it without going to an extreme. And, you know, and quite frankly, it's better for your health because India, um, you know, has some of the most polluted cities uh, in the whole world. If you try to stay there in, in, in one of those cities for more than a month, uh, you'll develop most likely a cough. I, I know I did. When I, when, I, when I stay in a city that's um, overly congested, um, I tend to develop a cough after about a month, which is my, you know, sort of my sign to get, to get out of there. And you know, what, what's really odd about these videos is that travel has become so much cheaper with the advent of Airbnb, it's also, it's not just Airbnb, you have VRBO, you have a lot of other things in addition to the main players. Uh, in terms of hotels, uh, you also have homestays, by the way, which are extremely cheap. Uh, we can find those on Agoda or Booking. Uh, Agoda and Booking are the same company based in the U.S., uh, but they but Booking tip, Booking.com uh, tends to cover the European area um, and the Western area, whereas Agoda tends to cover the Asian areas. Um, most notably in Southeast Asia. Uh, you also have a, a, some new players. It, you know, it used to be the cheapest hotels were called, uh, were managed by a company called Red Doors, uh, Doors with a Z at the end. Um, now that's, now you've got new players um, called, and one of them is called Oyo, O-Y-O. I've yet to stay in one of their hotels, um, but I think they're an Indian-backed company. So 
what you see now is that a lot of people would have, uh, that have the technological know-how, a lot of them are leveraging that technology um, and that technological infrastructure uh, into physical infrastructure. Uh, and that's not surprising given that, given that you know, these, the technology has basically taken over our lives. Um, and you, know, you, you can see that very clearly uh, with uh, not just the threat of hacking, um, you know, whether just um, through criminal activity um, in order to gain a ransom or in order to gain intelligence by state actors. Um, you can see that all over the world just, you know, simply because uh, there's no, it's not a coincidence that, you know, that trillion dollar companies within the U.S. are international in scope and involve basically Apple, Google, and Amazon. And basically all those, you know, all the players that you would expect um, to, to, to be using um, on an, on a regular basis, if you are, if you if you have any technology that's part of your life. So, for example, I'm using an iPhone right now, um, and so ultimately, what's what's interesting is that it's not just that the hotels are cheaper now, um, but also the fact that airfare can be cheap once you leave uh, certain jurisdictions. Now, um, it just so happens that airfare from Singapore uh, is quite expensive if you want to go to a place that's outside its typical region. Uh, so if you want to go from here to American Samoa, it's actually unbelievably expensive. Um, and that's because of, e of economics. You know, you don't, have, um, you don't have a lot of, you know, traffic economically between uh, American Samoa or Guam and Singapore. Even though uh, Singapore, um, you know, the, the United States has more money invested in Singapore than it does in all of China, um, which is remarkable um, given the difference in size. Now, what's interesting, um, you know, is that, you know, you've got a situation where you can get cheap airfare um, because a lot of expensive air airlines have actually tried to have a backup, uh, in, in other words, a low cost carrier uh, in order to generate cash flow. And also because, you know, you buy a new plane, you know, let's say you've got the, the flagship, you've got Singapore Airlines um, and you buy a new plane. Well, after 10 years, you can sort of, you know, either, either you buy it or, or you lease it. But after 10 years, you know, you, what do you do with it? You can turn it into scrap metal. You can do whatever you want. But ultimately, it makes more sense to you know, sort of try to get as much mileage as you can out of that plane um, by commissioning it to a subsidiary uh, that's a low-cost carrier. Uh, so that would be, in Singapore Airlines' case, that would be SCOOT, S-C-O-O-T. And almost all airlines, all major ones, do this. Uh, American Airlines has American Eagle. Um, you know, you just you just have to sort of you know. Then that's but that's typically for you know only domestic flights. But um, you have to sort of look at the routes, and that's easy to do because of technology. Now you, you've got apps called Skyscanner. Uh, you've got a lot of apps out there that can help you. Um, there's even apps on on airport transfers that I just discovered that make it a lot easier to get out of that airport uh, because it's not just the the cost of the airfare you want to consider. Um, you, know, one, you know, once you get out of, say, an expensive zone like Japan or Australia or, or um, the United States, you know, typically what you want to do is you want to fly into a hub and then from that hub, maybe stay one night and then go wherever you want to go. So it might actually be cheaper to fly from, say, USA into Singapore and then stay one night and then go from Singapore into Bangkok. Um, but again, it just depends on, you know, how you want to go about doing these things. Um, you know, and with the advent of low-cost carriers, um, you know, it, it, it really isn't, a, you, know, you don't really need to be in a position where uh, you're trying to hitchhike everywhere. In Europe, the train systems are amazing, uh, so much so that in Germany, uh, one of the national airlines went bankrupt because it was much more convenient for Germans to travel by train. Um, so you also want to look at trains. In most countries that are not as developed uh, the bus system is the way to go. And so um, whether you're in South America or in Asia, almost every city, major one, uh, has what's called a central bus terminal. Um, it's spelled differently. You want to figure out what it is in the language. But if you figure out where that is, um, you can just put it in Google Maps um, with the correct spelling and then head over there and buy a bus ticket. But what's wonderful about technology is you can actually do all that online now. There's a couple of um, websites that... Uh, you know, will show that to you. And, and one bus ride that would take about four hours um, to get from one city to the next, in some cases, will only, will only cost you about 2 to $3 uh, US. 
um, that's remarkable. So you know, the key the key cost is trying to get to uh, a country, and then once you're in that country, you know you want to look at the buses, depending on where you are, and the train system. The more developed the country is, you probably want to look at trains. The less developed, you want to look at buses. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of buses now uh, have air conditioning for the most part. Um, you know, but you can actually pay a little bit more to get the nice bus. And when when I say pay a little bit more, a little bit more. Uh, you might be looking at four dollars for you know a four-hour bus ride instead of two or three. Um, there's even a, a, an insurance policy you can buy that I just decided to add on because it was only fifty cents. Um, but in any case, um, so you can see that these videos not only do they not make a whole lot of sense uh, because of the way they're presented. Um, you know, just standing on you know just standing on the side of a road, hitchhiking with my thumb stuck out there for an hour or two. Doesn't sound very really appealing. It's not. It's not something that's going to help me. It's not. It's not going to help educate me. It's not going to help me see. Uh, I mean, you're on a highway. There's nothing around you. Um, so it's not going to. You're not going to gain anything. And you might as well just stay home um, if you're going to, you know, go to that kind of a length um, and try to explore your own city because you probably can walk in your own city. Um, and if and if you live in a city as opposed to a town, there's probably all kinds of places you haven't seen yet, uh, including museums um, and you know libraries and so on. Um, so the other part of this is history, which is what I mentioned at the very beginning. None of these people that travel, um, in the way that they're suggesting tend to have anything unique to add, uh, to the historical record. Uh, a lot of it, unfortunately, seems designed to capture some sort of, um, funny moment or uh, on, on video. So I think this one blogger has a couple of videos where he's, you know, having his head shaved. Uh, he's on a boat. Um, I mean, it's just... It's all really, really kind of odd. Um, because if you want to travel for a long time, typically you want to learn something. And to give you an idea of just how poor Western education is, um, just think about, let me give you a couple of, a couple of examples. Um, we all know that, that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Um, but he had never actually reached the United States. You know that if you travel to the Dominican Republic, um, I believe at one point uh, that was Christopher Columbus's base uh, before I think his body was actually returned to Spain. So if you're an educated person, you probably know all that. Uh, how, and, and that's more than what most people know. Most people still think that Columbus probably you know, reached the United States. Um, but let's, let's go a step further. Um, was, if, if I ask you, was Columbus, well, what country was Columbus from? Uh, a lot of you would say Spain. That's not true. Uh, but take a look at his name, Christopher Columbus. That's an Anglo name. Uh, if he's from Spain, why would that be his name? And a lot of people at this point might think, well, maybe he's English. I think Sir Francis Drake would be the greatest English navigator. Um, might have an issue with that. Um, but that actually makes sense, right? The name is, is Anglo. Um, but to give you an idea again, uh, Christopher Columbus is actually Italian. His name is Columbo. He has a lot of different names. Now, Columbus is, is one of those names. Depending on where you go, somebody famous will have a different name. Before Columbus and before Vasco da Gama and all these other European sailors, navigators, there was a Chinese guy called Zheng He. And Zheng He, Cheng Ho, Cheng He, Cheng Hu, or also known as Sam Po. Um, and I'm butchering the pronunciation, I'm sure. Um, but you can actually just look him up. Uh, and in fact, Vasco da Gama is rumored to have borrowed his maps. That's one of the reasons why... Um, a lot of sailors were so successful, um, you know, around the Spanish-Portuguese area, um, right after about 1511, which is when the Portuguese took over Malacca. Um, and when they took that, you know, when they actually ended up driving away competition from the uh, nearby, here actually, nearby Singapore, uh, they, they managed to get a foothold in, into an entirely new area, um, which then allowed them, using the maps that were probably available to them that they stole, um, you know, that's an, another thing about history is everyone steals from everyone else. Uh, so the whole, it's happened the whole, the whole time. Um, that's why it's so difficult to figure out, you know, who invented what. Uh, and I no longer even try to do that. I just try to look at something and try to figure out how it, whether or not it fits into the, into the local environment. Um, because whether somebody invented something or not, it's almost impossible to tell um, the farther back you go. And so in this case, uh, the educational system has failed because... Uh, most people don't even understand that Columbus had different names, uh, that he wasn't Spanish in origin, uh, that he was actually Italian, um, and so on. 
Now, if you don't know that basic fact about histories, uh, what else don't you know? Well, part of the reason is that the educational system in the West is dominated, dominated by a lot of different governmental interests. Uh, one of them is, um, you know, just the, the historical accident. Maybe it's not an accident, just a historical fact that the Catholic Church within Europe um, it's bound itself to local governments um, and in doing so uh, managed to get a monopoly on, on education up to, up to a certain point. Um, and so they use that in order to cement um, their status um, within society. And in the old days, you had to be, you know, a skilled craftsman, uh, you know, a blue collar worker, a blacksmith, or, you know, or you could be a priest. And, and a priest and a teacher were pretty much the same thing because uh, if you go back and look, you know, the, the, the Bible was something that was, um, you know, one of the first books to be published on a widespread basis um, after, the, after the printing press. Um, and one of the reasons that's the case is because, you know, one of the reasons it went through so many translations um, is, is also because of the reaction to the Catholic Church's monopoly on knowledge. The Bible originally was in Latin, the Catholic Church um, and the priests, um, and, you know, who were also teachers and missionaries at the same time. Um, you know, talk about theft. I mean, you know, the Spain stole almost all of Mexico's gold and silver. Uh, you can't steal something like that without trying to build something at the same time that makes you look like you're not, you know, a thief. And that's where the priests would come in from the Catholic Church. And so at least within Europe and within uh, the United States and, and basically North America and South America, obviously. Um, and, you know, you can see again historically why do they speak Spanish? Okay, why does, you know, why does the Italian language and the Portuguese language have so much in common? Uh, you can see all of that based on ship navigation, based on traveling. Um, and so, and also the, the way the educational system was designed. But if you had a, um, you know, a global education system, you would know right off the bat that Christopher Columbus was Italian, that ultimately, um, you know, he never made it to the United States, that ultimately the European navigators were successful because they probably stole uh, a lot of the Asian navigational maps, for, uh, Chinese navigational maps, uh, from this guy called Zhang He. And um, that's an, an interesting story as well. Um, but, you know, he was a Chinese Muslim, by the way. That's, that's, you know, interesting, right? All these major empires um, seem to have stolen people. He was actually from a Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese Buddhism and Muslim family. So he was, growing up, he was quite diverse. Uh, so, but you can see right off the bat that, you know, every country has historically stolen immigrants or tried to take the best talent from other countries. Uh, that's the point of being an empire is you can steal other people's best people, uh, other countries' best people. And you're not going to survive if you don't do that. So there's, there's this, this immigration uh, context, you know, all these immigration debates, um, you know, especially within Europe now, um, a lot of them, you know, again, come into context very quickly uh, once you realize just the, the, the scale of theft, uh, both of knowledge and resources, as well as just the idea that, you know, it was sort of natural for, to uh, get the best people you could. And in, in almost all cases, the ones that were, were cut out or shut out from the public government, government, governmental employment system, you know, they were the ones that were willing to take a lot more risk. You can see that in India, by the way, the Sikhs were shut out, they were not Hindu, so they were shut out um, from the uh, governmental hiring process. As a result, they became very skilled in opening up shops and becoming um, just business people. And so that's where they were able to gain a lot of influence because they were shut out from the public market, basically. Um, and that, that happens a lot, right? And so you, know, you look at ships, how did they get financing? A lot of it was through stocks and bonds or it was through uh, corporations, whether it was either the Dutch East India Company or the British India Company. That were, you know, we all know about the Dutch um, East India Company, but there were tons of these places and, and tons of these little corporations um, that issued stock for a finite time in order to you know, go travel and then come back. And in, in many cases, uh, the stock would expire after a certain amount of time. Um, and, you know, the investors would get their money back plus interest and so on. And so you can see, you know, right off the bat that the educational system doesn't work because if you only know about the Dutch East India Company, uh, you don't even understand how all this was financed. You don't even you know, or I, I didn't understand how, how this was financed. I didn't understand uh, the alliances between the private sector and the public sector, um, you know, which has been just that sort of getting that balance right uh, has always been an issue. Um, and, you know, you can see that, especially within Europe, especially with debt. Um, and, you know, how do you finance different, you know, how do you finance new business ventures? 
uh, and that's where the stock market would come in. Um, and of course, you had bubbles, you know, that, that went along with that. But a lot of fraudsters that went along with that, a lot of charlatans that went along with that. So these, these are all things that have happened for quite some time. And one of the reasons that we don't come up with solutions for them is because we tend to forget um, their, what happened within context. And one of the reasons for that is because the Western educational system is deficient because it's, it's training people in a, in a way that is local, uh, especially with respect to the liberal arts. Uh, and, and when I say local, it means that, you know, you're not looking at, say, Chinese, Japanese, Buddhism. You're not looking at Hinduism. You're not looking at um, a lot of the, the different factors that shaped Asia. Uh, you're not looking at Islam for the most part. Uh, part of that is the influence within the United States of the Catholic Church, which typically tends to have a majority on the Supreme Court um, and also within the political sphere, uh, as well as perhaps police departments um, and locally. Uh, so you've got that national and you've got that you know, local influence um, and just the idea that the Catholic Church has been able to gain influence uh, in some cases by uh, trying to replace public services in the area of healthcare, hospitals, and education, Catholic schools. Um, and so, you, and, and in doing so, leveraged that influence, um, you know, over a long period of time, um, you know, in order to uh, try to create its own worldview. Unfortunately, that worldview, to the extent that that influence in the private sector seeps over into the public sector, which we know always happens, they, they, there's always a balance that sometimes goes out of whack, but there's always a, an exchange of ideas between the public and private sectors. And the problem with that is that you don't have an educational system that's training you uh, to be a global citizen to the extent that it doesn't include um, places in the world where the Catholic Church had no influence. That, that would include, like I said, most of Asia. Um, that would include, uh, you know, well, Russia. Russia is, is Orthodox. Uh, they became Christian in, right around 1000 AD. Um, and so that's a and, – and the thing is I don't know anything about that history uh, because I was, I was educated in the West. And I would have to take a class to figure all these things out. And there's not a whole lot of translations that I can depend on. Uh, partly because the educational system is so deficient um, where I grew up. And I grew up in, not in a village. I grew up in one of the uh, most advanced places in the world, in uh, what's, what's commonly, referred, commonly referred to as Silicon Valley. Um, and so you've got these sorts of interesting, you know, sort of lessons. Then, and one of the lessons I want to teach you is that, um, you know, if you, don't, if you didn't know anything about Zhang He, uh, if you didn't know anything about Christopher Columbus being Italian or having, you know, the name Colombo, uh, what else don't you know? Um, I'll leave you with another two, two other interesting tidbits. Um, one of them was uh, Martin Luther King. We all know about the speech, I Have a Dream. But why don't you know about the speech called Beyond Vietnam? And go ahead and look at that speech. It's critical of the U.S. government, uh, much more so, much more concretely. And exactly one year after Martin Luther King gave that speech, he was killed on the exact date. So... Interesting. Why don't you know that? Most people don't know that either. Um, another one, the Vietnam War was in fact supported by, uh, was, was a, a, essentially a way of installing a person called Diem, D-I-E-M, in the South um, and basically trying to separate the North from the South. Um, Hanoi versus Saigon or Hanoi versus Ho Chi Minh. And, you know, you want to look at why. Why did that happen? Um, and and I, you know, what you can do is look up the religion of Diem, uh, and look at what the um, these you know, look at who was supporting uh, that southern sort of sphere of power uh, within that area at that time. So, and if you didn't know that before you heard me speak, um, you know what else don't you know? And until all these problems are fixed, until these gaps are filled in uh, with something other than meaning, meaningless surveillance, um, what's going to happen is we're going to keep making these same mistakes because the solutions won't be there to the extent that we live in a global economy, but the solutions are based on only a knowledge that is from only one part of the world. And, you know, you can only imagine, you know, when you, when you consider history that way, what sanctions, um, you know, mean to you. In other words, you're building a wall, um, you know, both economically, financially, and, 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 you know, based on immigration as well. Um, and that always takes me to Robert Frost. Uh, you know, before I built a wall, I'd like to know who I was walling in and who I was walling out, probably whom, um, whom I was walling out. And because in many cases, when you, you build those walls uh, and you lose the benefit of immigration, you lose that benefit of trying to steal uh, the world's best people. 
um, which is made easier if you have a strong currency. And in fact, is actually the point of having a strong currency because um, if you're successful uh, under the current economic system, prices go up. That's what inflation is, uh, making it more difficult for people living in the country to have children. You end up replacing that, or at least they, de they delay it. Uh, you end up replacing that that sort of you know uh, gap with Im immigrants. Um, that's otherwise, if you don't do that, you end up with a demographic problem, which is what Japan is going through uh, right now. Um, and so all these big issues like immigration, you know, um, the stock market, all these things sort of make more sense. Um, bubbles, you know, they all make more sense um, the more you travel, but only if you're paying attention and, um, and only if you have at least some curiosity. Um, so anyway, hopefully we can, and, and by the way, I haven't been to southern, the southern part of Africa. I've only been to, within Africa, I've only been to a few countries in the north. Um, I haven't been to China, and I haven't been to Russia. So what my knowledge, to be clear, is not complete at all. Um, it's only enough for me to know how little I actually know and how almost everything that was taught to me in my schooling system for 12 years, or probably, to be fair, probably more like, you know, let's see, yeah, starting from middle school onward. Um, so you know, you've got about you know, seven, seven years uh, that... I could have learned something interesting, that I could, that I could have expanded my horizons. Um, and I just sort of feel like I've wasted those seven years. Um, and so that doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be the, you know, and, and one of the reasons that it is such a, uh, a difficult situation is because we know the system from middle school to high school isn't working. And the, the reason we know that is because the smartest people uh, tend to be the ones that just don't like middle school and high school, but love college. And we know this, but we don't do anything about it. And, you know, the reason that, it's, that it is that way is because the schooling system is essentially uh, worse than a waste of time. Uh, it's, it's just something that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and it has to change in order for society to continue in a progressive way. Uh, and by pro progressive, I just mean in a, in a, in a way that makes sense. Um, and we, we just, if, it, if we keep doing things that don't work, um, I don't know what we expect um, other than a steady decline. And if you care about your country, um, and if you care about the future of humanity, uh, this is something to think about uh, when you look at these travel videos, um, because you don't have to do it the way they're doing it. You just have to do it in a way that makes sense to you. Um, and that could mean anything that helps make the world make more sense to you.